Hey guys, Missy Kitten here. So today for Crime Files Friday, we will be covering Le Faire Gregory, or the murder of Gregory Vilman. Now, I promise um, designs by Billy or William S. I am working on John Schaefer. I have his name written down. I am working on that one, don't worry. I just had to finish this case and then we'll, I will start the research on that one. But we are going to work on this case today since this is all finished. Now, to be honest, there is a lot more research I could have done as there is the whole documentary on this on Netflix of Who Killed Little Gregory, which I very much recommend that if you have Netflix, to definitely check this one out because whew, it's it's everywhere and if you're like me it's it's very captivating so i did get into some of the info that they have in the documentary and everything else i found everywhere I would have gone through the whole documentary, but this is already super long as it is, so I didn't want this video to go on forever as it would if I had gotten every detail from the documentary. So let's get started. Gregory Vilman was born August 24th, 1980. He was from Le Pont sur Valone in, in France. His parents, Jean-Marie and Christine Vilmon, were fairly wealthy. They had recently built a home not far outside of the small village of Le Pont sur Valone. Jean-Marie had been promoted to foreman at the place that he was employed. And it is important to note that where he was working, that they called him boss. That is going to come very important in later. So things were really going well for this little family of three. And that was until October 16th of 1984. Christine had given her four-year-old Gregory a nice little blue woolen hat to wear outside as it was chilly while he played in a little gravel pile that was in front of their yard. And then not long after five, Christine stopped her ironing and went to go check on her son to bring him in. But when she went out there, little Gregory was not there. So she immediately got in her car and started driving around looking for her little boy. But throughout the village, no one had seen little Gregory. So this would be the very beginning of what is probably France's most notorious cold case. At approximately 5.30 p.m., Michelle Vilmon, Michelle, Michelle, sorry, Jean-Marie's brother received an anonymous phone call stating, I took revenge on the boss and kidnapped his son. I strangled him and threw him into the Valone. His mother is looking for him, but she will not find him. My revenge is done. The police searched, and at 9 p.m., the body of little Gregory was found floating in the Valone River. The boy's hands and feet were bound, and his woolen hat was pulled over his strangely calm face. The caller was dubbed the Raven, and this was not the first time that this family had heard from this mysterious Raven. In fact, the calls actually began in 1981. The Raven called various members of the family and would not only 
threaten them. But give them personal information. He would tell family secrets. I think my camera is a little out of focus. Sorry about that. He would give family secrets and he would go on these envious rants. He would sometimes just play music over the phone or sometimes just sit there silently. So very weird guy, this Raven. But on April 24th, 1983, Jean-Marie Vilmon received a call from the Raven stating how they intended to rape Christine, but didn't get the chance because she didn't leave the house. Jean-Marie managed to remain calm, kept his cool, knowing that you don't let them know that you're getting angry and they know they don't have power over you. But then they said, I'll take it out on your brat. It'll hurt you more. Don't leave him alone. I watch him with binoculars. Naturally, little Gregory was Jean-Marie's Achilles heel. Don't touch my son. You're a dead man if you do. The Raven then said that it would be the last time that he would, that Jean-Marie would hear from him. And this was true up until the day of Gregory's death. The day after the young boy's parent, his, the young boy's death, his parents received a letter from the Raven. It stated, I hope you die of grief, boss. Your money can't give you back your son. Here is my revenge, you stupid bastard. Based on the calls years prior that contained information that only those in the family or very close to the family, I am derping up what I just said. <laughs> Since the, they gave information that only someone in the family or close to the family would know, obviously people in the family were the top suspects. So family members were asked to give handwriting samples, both right-handed and left-handed. Analysis pointed to Jean-Marie's first cousin, Bernard LaRoche. This was the first break in a fairly messy investigation. Le petit juge, if I am saying that right, I am not French, but I am just trying to just fit in with what they said in the case. Or the little judge, as it means in English. Jean-Michel Lambert, age 32, was in his first investigation and was under extreme media pressure. Due to all of this pressure and everything, he made critical procedural errors. He fail failed to secure the crime scene or even a full autopsy. So when Bernard LaRoche's arrest was made in November, it was quite a break in the case. LaRoche's alibi depended on his sister-in-law, Muriel Bull, but their stories were conflicting and witness testimony pointed out flaws in Muriel's story. Muriel's story was that she got on the bus after school and it was her usual bus driver. And then when she got to her destination, LaRoche was already there. But LaRoche's story was that when he got to the destination, Muriel was already there. Not only that, schoolmates said that Muriel got into a car that day and did not get on the bus. And the bus driver that day was, in fact, 
not the usual bus driver, and had not seen Muriel get on the bus. So the police confronted Muriel on these discrepancies, and she proceeded to tell them how Bernard picked her up from school. They drove for a while before they arrived at a house. Bernard told her to stay in the car, then exited, and when he came back, he had a child. They drove again and then stopped at a river. LaRoche exited, taking this, take, this time taking the child with him. When he returned, the child was not with him. Bernard LaRoche, LaRoche uh, fit perfectly. But two days after this, Muriel Bull recanted her statement. She claimed the police pressured her, and that's why she gave her she gave the story that she did. Then, because this kind of stuff always happens, rumors began to spread that her family was abusing her. And that's why she recanted. Of course, she and the family said no one was abusing anyone, but who knows? So after some time and against the public prosecutor's advice, Lambert ordered that Bernard be released from prison. So, Jean-Marie and Christine were unconvinced that Bernard was not the Raven, and they wanted revenge on their son's killer. Sorry, me turning pages is so loud. Jean Kerr, a reporter and I quote-unquote friend, I guess, his relationship with the Vermonts was a little bit complicated. If you watch the documentary, you would kind of see what I mean. So he told of a day where he talked to the parents. He went to their house, I believe, because they called him over. And they told him what their plan was. They intended to kill LaRoche when he was on his way to work, and then they intended to turn themselves in immediately afterwards. He, John Kerr begged them to not kill Bernard LaRoche. And before he left their home, Jean Marie promised John Kerr that they would not act on their plans. However, John Kerr had a hunch and arrived at the location before Bernard LaRoche ever did. And lo and behold, there was Jean Marie and Christine hiding out. The three of them managed to sit there bickering between each other for a while, and LaRoche managed to speed by. And naturally that made Jean-Marie and Christine fairly angry, but what are you gonna do, I guess? <laughs> but sadly, after this incident, a case soon began to build against none other than Gregory's own mother, Christine Valmon. The case had been moved from the local I knew how to say this. I had listened to the pronunciation. Ah. Jen. Genda Marie. I really. I'm sorry. I had it. Or, for lack of a better word, law enforcement. That's why I've been saying police all this other time because you know what? They're law enforcement. They're basically soldiers who are doing law enforcement. So it was moved from them. Mm. My phone just freaked out and my computer freaked out at the same time. That 
was not fun. But anyway, it was moved from them to the CID or Criminal Investigation Department in nearby Nancy. Now, this was not the only news about Christine, though. It turned out Christine Vilmon was pregnant. And upon hearing news that um, analysts decided that now it was her handwriting that matched the Raven's letter and on the radio, and not from officials at that, she began hemorrhaging. So once the public found out that Christine was pregnant, there were a lot of negative reactions. People were saying like, oh, she's replacing Gregory, and she's moved on far too quickly. She must be guilty, and she's only pregnant. That way, she's protecting herself from prison and all these sorts of things. So now, not only did the public have the handwriting analysis to judge her off of, three local women soon came forward claiming that they saw Christine at the local post office the day of the murder, which was the same day and location that the Raven's revenge letter came from. Many people saw these three women as unreliable sources because when they came forward, they were seen walking out of the, I believe it was the courthouse, you know, when they went and gave their statement. They were, they came out and they were all laughing and people saw that as very unreliable. So, and not only did they have now these three women, there was string that was the same that was, that was found wrapped around poor little Gregory in the parents' house cellar. So evidence was stacking up against Christine Vilmon. Then, on March 29th, 1985, stressed, confused, and hurting, Jean-Marie went to little Gregory's grave. He sat there for a while before he took his hunting rifle and went to the home of Bernard LaRoche. Now, according to Jean-Marie, LaRoche told him that he got what was coming to him, that he deserved what happened, which was further fuel to the idea that LaRoche was indeed the Raven. According to Marie Ange, Bernard's wife, Bernard begged for his life and swore he was innocent and said, Jean-Marie, put the gun down, we can talk about this, and all these sorts of things. But regardless of what was said, that day, Jean-Marie Vauman shot and killed Bernard LaRoche. Jean-Marie then turned himself in immediately after. Bernard LaRoche's epitaph reads, Here lies Bernard LaRoche an innocent victim of blind hatred. Then, a few months after the killing, another letter from the Raven was received. This one, however, was sent to Jean-Marie's parents' house. But either way, no matter where it's sent, that doesn't matter because the Raven was still at large. Lambert would have Christine arrested and charged with the murder of little Gregory. In July of 1985, Christine was placed in pretrial detention. And then despite being pregnant, she launched a hunger strike and it lasted 11 days. Then she was freed, though she was not fully cleared for eight years. While Jean-Marie was convicted of the murder of LaRoche and sentenced to five years in prison, he received credit for time served while awaiting trial and a partial suspension 
of the sentence, and he was released in December of 1987. To this day, the murder of little Gregory remains unsolved. Now, these are some things that I feel were important to note that I found later on while rewatching the documentary a bit after I did the main research and had it going a little bit. So, upon showing off his nice new things to his brother, Michel, Michel sat on Jean-Marie's couch and said, only a boss would buy all this. Now, some people probably would say, oh, that's nothing, but the Raven constantly called him a boss in all the letters. So I thought that was very important to kind of note. Now, also, sorry if you can hear my dog barking. The local police stated that the official cause of death was asphyxiation by drowning. But the, everything the raven always said was that he strangled little Gregory. Now, I don't know if that's really any really important things to know. I just found that a little bit curious. But that's just, to me, a little bit interesting. And again, local police found an empty insulin vial and a hypodermic syringe on the riverbank. Now, this could have rendered Gregory unconscious, explaining his oddly calm face, and it would not have shown up in an autopsy. However, pathologists never checked for any needle marks on the body. Christine constantly stated that the happiness would not last, as if she knew something bad were going to happen. Again, I just found these things a little bit interesting, so I figured I would write them in. Now, this one is pretty out there. I found it very odd. A local coffee shop owner had a strange new customer who ordered one beer, stared at the clock, left, came back at 5 p.m., sat in the exact same spot, had money ready to pay, and stayed until 5.10 p.m. He was also very jittery and very nervous. That's something I found odd. Now, we are back on the topic of Jean Kerr, the reporter slash somewhat friend. He went to Louisette Jacob's house. Now, Louisette Jacob, she is the aunt of Jean Marie and Bernard LaRoche. Now, he initially went there just to talk to Louisette. Then he heard some barking coming from a room and then the door opened and out walked Bernard LaRoche. So Jean Kerr said, Louisette, I didn't know you had a boyfriend. And LaRoche said, I'm not her boyfriend, I'm her nephew. And now my dad is snow blowing outside, so I am so very sorry. This just keeps going so horribly wrong for me. But when they began talking about it, LaRoche said that he was sleeping at Louisette's house. So when Jean Kerr asked about the Velmans, Bernard got angry and he said, they played me like a fool. They paid for what they did. They took advantage of me. They cheated me. They had me cut their wood and deliver it. Sure, they paid me, but they only paid me for the gas in my tractor. They treat me like an outsider. They cut me out. 
Jean Kerr then said, but Jean Marie, the child. Jean Kerr then claimed that Laroche erupted and his eyes were bulging. They paid for what they did. But we're talking about a child, Jean Kerr said. Yes, that's sad, but they paid for what they did. Jean then asked why he was sleeping with, at his aunt's place. Laroche said, I can't sleep at night, so I come and I sleep at my grandparents' home. So I assume that it was his grandparents' house and Louisette just owned it now or something, but that's... That kind of didn't make sense to me, but I'm just taking it as the documentary said. John Kerr then asked Bernard if he had a home somewhere. He says, I have a house in the Heights, but it is not done yet. I also have a wife and a son. Bernard left the room and Jean Kerr asked Louisette why Bernard was sleeping there. He is scared, she said. Why? Since when? Kerr asked. Since the child's death. Now, this could be connected to Jean Marie stating, if I find my son's murderer, I'll find him and shoot him in his own home in the dead of night. Now, again, on the topic of Bernard LaRoche, Marie Ange, Bernard's wife, filed tips against two distant family members. Could this have been a way to kind of keep them away from Bernard? I, again, I am so sorry. I had no idea my dad planned on snow blowing like right outside my window. Now, still, again, on the topic of Bernard, Jean-Marie and Bernard actually used to be very close until they got married and their jobs began to cause tension in between them. And now, Lambert was, sorry about that. Judge Lambert was actually seen as a, was actually seen as very unreliable. He left for two days before ever talking to Muriel Bull after she gave her statement. But he did later commit suicide in 2017. Now, again, with Jean Kerr, because he actually played a huge part in this, surprisingly, you wouldn't think a reporter would, but he surprisingly did. When asked by Kerr about the call from the Raven, Michelle got, got extremely pale and looked almost guilty. Then after Kerr left, Monique and Albert argued with Jean Marie and Christine about Michelle. They were trying like they were trying to protect him. Monique was angry with Jean-Marie for constantly questioning Michelle and about him. Jean-Marie then said, this will be the last time we see my parents. Now, again, with Bernard and Michelle, Bernard visited Michelle the day Gregory died at around 4 p.m. That's a little bit suspicious in my opinion, but now back to Muriel, when she retracted her statement, she did so on television. And it was so obvious by her body language that something was off. You know, she was constantly like, She never looked anyone in the eye. She was constantly licking her lips like she was nervous, like her mouth kept drying out. And, you know, it was, you could tell she wasn't comfortable, almost as if she was forced to be doing it. And then rumors had also stated 
that before she recanted, she was placed in a, well, not just placed, locked in a barn that was between the bull home and her neighbors. That's fucked up. Now, footage also showed family members being fairly rough with her when she was going to, like, the courthouse to meet in, like, face-to-face with Bernard. Like, they were, like, really jerking her around and everything, and I was just like, that doesn't, doesn't seem right. And finally, one of the very most important things, I saved the best for last, It was determined that the raven was not just one person. It was at least two, a man and a woman. So even if Bernard was indeed a part of the raven, that still leaves the woman out there. Now, in my opinion on this case, to be honest, This sounds like a giant ass family cover up. I think most of the family was in on it, to be honest. And they were fine getting rid of this beautiful little boy. And that's just so heartbreaking. But like I said, I would, if I were you and you had Netflix, definitely watch the documentary. It gives a lot more information. Like I said, this video is already 32 minutes as of right now. I just got to the 32 minute mark. So I would have put so much more, but where I stopped in that, I was only like halfway through episode three. So, I could have gone more. I put a little bit that I remembered from my first time watching it. So, I didn't want to overload this video. This video could have gone so much longer. So, like I said, I definitely watch it if you are interested in learning more about this case. There is a lot more to it than I think any of us could ever really know. But, yeah. I think that's going to have to be it for this case. Uh, Hopefully someday, you know, they can find closure for little Gregory. Find out who did this to him. But, one thing I also do remember is that someone probably... Muriel's mother was diabetic. So that is another link there. So keep that in mind too. I don't want to sound biased by saying I do think it's Bernard. I think it is probably the entire family in on it. But that's just me because it just seems like everyone's covering up everyone's asses. But that's going to be it for this video before I make it go any longer. And I am so sorry for all the noises going around like crazy in this video. (sighs) Gotta love Michigan and the snow, guys. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't have the snowblower noise. But thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you all next time.